Welcome to the Climate Report. This is Hart Hagen on WFMP FM Louisville. This is episode 15 of the Climate Report, and on this episode, we will talk about how and why to choose the best native plants. And you might ask, what do native plants have to do with climate? We will address that issue. We will also talk about how to use the native plant finder of the National Wildlife Federation. What are some of the benefits of native plants for our ecosystems and how to identify and remove invasive species and why to even be concerned about invasive species. In this instance, we're talking about invasive plant species. First, let me invite you to support listener-supported radio. We are listener-supported radio. We are not beholden to any corporate interests. We are free from any restrictions or cautions as to what any uh, corporations might want us to talk about or not talk about. If you can support listener-supported radio, go to forwardradio.org and click on Donate. So let's talk about why are plants and animals and ecosystems important. So the topic of this show is how to choose the best native plants. And the purpose of this topic is so we can focus on how to support ecosystems. So here's the thing. The human species is part of nature. Now, it might not seem like we're part of nature all the time, and it might not feel like we're part of nature. And indeed, the human species is so intelligent and so powerful, and in some ways a little bit misguided, in that we think we can live on this planet without the natural resources that we evolved with on this planet. But that is uh, a really a dangerous mindset. So in order to avoid that mindset, we need to be educated and aware, and we need to be able to look around us and say, what's working here and what's not? Now, when I talk about having an appreciation of nature, it's not just about being able to appreciate nature, but it's about looking around us and seeing what is broken in, the, our, in our natural world. And what's broken in our natural world today is that human beings take up so much space, not just with buildings and roadways, but we take up space with our lawns. And you know, a lawn, for example, is not wildlife habitat. So we need to reduce the amount of lawn that we have and increase the number of plant species, the number of native plants that we have on our home landscapes, on our corporate landscapes, and in our public parks. One reason for this is that wildlife is declining. And if we want wildlife to turn around and go back in the right direction, then we need to give it the food that it needs to eat especially bees, butterflies, and birds. We have the capability, even in urban environments, to give bees, butterflies, and birds what they need to eat. And what they need more than anything else is native plants that support their food chains. So the purpose of this episode is to help us think about, is to give you the tools to pick the best native plants. So in a minute, we're going to go to the website of the Native Plant Finder at the National Wildlife Federation. But first, why are plants, animals, and ecosystems important to human beings? I mean, aren't human beings smart enough to live on this planet without nature? Well, here are some of the reasons why nature is important to human beings. For one thing, do we want oxygen in abundance or do we want a shortage of oxygen? Plants make 
the oxygen that we breathe. So every time we take a breath, we can thank the plant life on Earth for that. But plants depend on ecosystems. Two examples. One is that plants on land require pollination. Trees require pollination. Flowers require pollination. The foods that we eat require pollination. And yet, pollinators have declined approximately 75%, at least insects as a whole, have declined 75% in recent decades. There's an increasing amount of scientific evidence that shows that insects are declining rapidly. Some have called this the insect holocaust. It's a serious situation. It's alarming to scientists. And in order to turn that around, we need native plants. We also need to reduce the amount of insecticide that we use. We also need to make sure that insects have sources of water, and we also need to make sure that insects have sources of shelter. All of this so that insects can pollinate the plants and plants can generate oxygen. Another reason that we depend on plants, animals, and ecosystems is we need them for clean water. Plants, especially trees, they filter the water. They keep the water from going too quickly into the streams and waterways. They, they prevent erosion and they prevent too much, too many pollutants from being washed from our properties into the streams, into the rivers. So we need an abundance of Clean, uh, we need an abundance of native plants in order to filter water so that we have cleaner water for both humans and wildlife. Another reason that we need plants and animals and ecosystems in abundance is that this is what will give us more nutritional foods cheaper and more abundantly, as opposed to a situation where food is more expensive and less abundant. And the reason this is an issue is that a decline in pollinators means a decline in nutrition. Pollinators, if they are in abundance, help our crops to be more abundant, and that means more nutrition less expensively. Another reason why we need plants, animals, and ecosystems is the mental health benefits that we stand to gain. Studies have shown that if a person spends at even 15 minutes a day in a natural setting, then that has mental health benefits and physical benefits that are similar to the benefits of mindfulness meditation. So there are mental health benefits and physical benefits to being in a natural setting even 15 minutes a day. And we can have this in urban areas. We, don't, we not only don't have to limit nature to natural areas, we cannot limit nature to natural areas. When we try to limit wildlife to natural areas, that only results in a decline in wildlife because, you know, a bee doesn't know where the park ends and where the highway begins or where the, you know, in a, in a, in a bird doesn't know where the, 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 the state park ends and where the residential area begins. So we need to have wildlife habitat within our residential areas and even within commercial development. So far I've been talking about why we need nature, but let's talk now about how we can bring about natural uh, ecosystems with, you know, where we live, where we work, where we play, where we travel. So what we want to do now is we want to learn how to use the Native Plant Finder on the website of 
the National Wildlife Federation. So even though you can't see the screen as I can, I believe you'll be able to follow along with, with what I'm doing. So the website is nwf.org slash native plant finder. That's nwf.org slash native plant finder. So when you go to that website, you will see a place where you can click on a place to enter your zip code because this database, this is a database and it wants to know your zip code. It wants to know where you live. So I'm going to type in my zip code and then I'm going to tell you a little bit about what this database is and how it came about. So my zip code is 40241. Type that in and then it knows where I live. So what this database is, it was created by Dr. Doug Tallamy, who is an entomologist. He's an insect scientist. So Dr. Tallamy's area of specialty within insect science is butterflies. And this database is a database of what plants are the biggest help to the most butterflies, specifically caterpillars. Now I'll explain and describe as we go why caterpillars are important. And I will explain and describe as we go why caterpillars are a really good indication of what it takes to build a really good ecosystem. But first, I'm going to click on this link that says Find Native Plants. So if you're just joining me, I'm at the Native Plant Finder of the National Wildlife Federation, that's NWF dot org slash native plant finder. The native plant finder is a database that will tell you given your zip code or your county but given your zip code what are the best plants in your area and why. So I'm going to click on this link. I've already entered my zip code. I'm going to click on this link that says find native plants and what comes up is two types of plants. One is flowers and grasses and the other is trees and shrubs. I'm going to click on trees and shrubs and what we find from this database, from this website, is that the top ranking tree, top ranking plant in my locality is oak. And what it says here, it has the number 478. That means that oaks support 478 different species of caterpillars in my locality. Now, why are caterpillars so important? Well, for one thing, caterpillars are leaf-eating insects. Now, caterpillars are not the only leaf-eating insects. Leaf-eating insects include beetles and uh, lots, lots of things. But the, if oak ranks number one for, if oak is the number one choice for caterpillars, then it's probably also the number one choice for other leaf-eating insects. So oak is number one. The number two is a genus called prunus that means plums and cherries american plum black cherry etc which as a group as a genus supports 352 species of caterpillars in my locality number three is birch now that you see a lot of birch trees around because they're nice for landscaping they're pretty rugged and resilient and but they're also number three on the list and they support 282 species of caterpillars in my locality. Now, if you're in Kentucky, yours is probably very similar to this. If you're in Missouri or Virginia or in the southern part of Indiana or Ohio, or uh, your list is probably going to be very similar to this. 
Number fourth on the list is willow. Now, when we say willow, we're not talking, we're, we're talking about native willows. We're not talking about Japanese willow. We're not talking about weeping willow because those are non-native willows. But uh, if it's a native willow, then it supports 275 species of caterpillars. And we could go on down the list. Maple is number five. Maple and box elder are in the same genus. A genus is a group of species. But the genus in which maple and box elder are it supports 259 species of caterpillars. So we're talking about hundreds of different caterpillars per genus. Now, that's a lot because here's the thing. Some plants support zero caterpillars and therefore they support, probably support zero other leaf-eating insects. And they're just not what our local leaf-eating insects need Therefore, they are not what our local pollinators need, and they're not what our, you know, take birds or anything that eats insects is, is going to need an abundance of insects. So if we want to have an abundance of insects, then we want to have a great variety and diversity of native plants, especially those native plants that rank high and support hundreds of species of caterpillars. I'm going to keep going down the list, but I'm going to make a mental note to myself. I want to know when this list, uh, you know, what's the highest ranking or what's the lowest ranking plant on this list that supports at least a hundred. But we're going to keep going. So number six on the list is crab apple. Uh, now that it needs to be a native crab apple. There are non-native crab apples, but it needs to be a native one. And it supports 246 species of caterpillars. Now, why is that important? Because caterpillars are leaf-eating insects, and this is an excellent indication of what supports other leaf-eating insects. And another reason that's important is that, you know, let's talk about what birds need. Now, what we've been talking about I've been talking a lot about caterpillars, but this is what birds need too, because guess what? Birds eat caterpillars. Now, do they eat caterpillars in the winter? No, because caterpillars aren't around in the winter. They're cold-blooded animals. They don't, they don't go around in the winter. Uh, do they eat caterpillars in the fall? No. Do they eat caterpillars in the summer? Well, not so much. They eat caterpillars in the spring when they're having babies. That's another reason why this is so important. Not just that it feeds the caterpillars, but that it on up the food chain. What eats caterpillars? Birds. Uh, not all birds, but most birds, when they're having babies, need caterpillars. Let me tell you a story about a little bird. It's called a Carolina chickadee. Carolina chickadee is one of the smallest birds there is. It weighs a third of an ounce. If you held four pennies in your hand, that would be about the same as the weight of a Carolina chickadee. It's a very small bird. And yet, and yet, when a Carolina chickadee is eating, or when a Carolina chickadee is feeding its young in the spring, guess how many caterpillars it needs to eat and consume and gorge down its throat and stuff down its baby's throat? 1,500 caterpillars over, I mean, I'm sorry, 7,500 caterpillars over the course of 15 days. That's one pair of birds and their young. It takes one pair of Carolina chickadees, 7,500 caterpillars within a 15-day span to feed their young in the spring. If we want to know one reason why one, probably the top reason why most birds are declining, it's because they don't have enough to feed their young when they are reproducing. It doesn't matter how much bird seed we give them in the winter. If they can't reproduce in the spring, then their populations are going to go down. 
So that's another reason why this list is important. Number seven on the list is, is a genus that includes hickory and pecans and pig nuts and butternuts, but hickory. Um, and it supports 234 species of caterpillars in my locality. And number eight on the list is aspen. Number nine is cranberry, n n cranberry and blueberry. That's n it's the genus Vaccinium, native cranberries, native blueberries. It uh, falls at number 11 on the list. Number 12 is pine. Number 13 is elm. Number 14 is alder. And we could keep going. But one thing I wanted, one resource I wanted to point you to is I have a handy dandy list of the top 100 plants for wildlife. You can find it in, uh, you can find it by typing the following into your browser, bit.ly slash top 100 plants. That's top 100 plants, bit.ly slash top 100 plants and then hit enter and then if you are in my locality Louisville Kentucky this will give you a list of the top 100 so the thing is if you plant you know you start at the top of the list as opposed to what well traditionally horticulture and landscaping have been all about appearance and design beauty and, and and appearance and design without much regard for ecological benefits this is a list that is a guide to the plants that have the greatest ecological benefits that means they feed the most caterpillars therefore they you know if you therefore they provide the greatest diversity of animals because you need a diversity of animals you need a diversity of plants in order to have a diversity of animals now on this list just like i was going through before oaks are the number are, are number one plums and cherries are number two willows are number three uh, birch is number four maple and box elder is number five number six is hickory number seven is aspen cottonwood poplar all in the same, different species in the same genus. Uh, num number eight is is, ap is crab apple. Number nine is cranberry and blueberry. Number 10 is pine. Number 11 is elm. Number 12 is alder. Uh, 13 basswood. 14 walnut. 15 ash. 16 uh, blackberry. 17 beech. 18 hawthorn. 19 chestnut. 20 is viburnum. We could we could keep going on, but the thing is that this is a very definitive list, and this is a good guide to what to plant, as opposed to what, as opposed to oh I have a couple of native plants, or maybe even I have a lot of native plants, and that's a good thing to have a lot of native plants. But if you have r room for trees, then uh, the, the best best things for wildlife is to plant these high ranking trees like oaks and plums and cherries etc that way we have a good quantitative indicator of whether we are planting what uh, what wildlife needs and we if we can do this in our yards if we can do this on a neighborhood wide basis if we can do this in some of our green spaces and our public spaces, this absolutely uh, will get results. Uh, now, what are a couple? How do I know this will get results? Well, for one thing, the year that we're in, 2018, it's the best year in 25 years for monarch butterflies. Monarch butterflies have been going down, down, down for the last 20, 30 years. Uh, because of loss of habitat and loss of food. Now, monarch butterflies need milkweed for food. 
but as a result of gardeners planting milkweed, planting milkweed, planting milkweed, we're having a good year with monarch butterflies. Now, I don't know that scientifically. It, it's From a scientific standpoint, it's just a guess. But I do know that in the last 10 years, more people have been conscious of the need for native plants. People have been planting milkweed, and I have to believe that that is the main reason why the, the monarchs are having such a good year this year. Another reason I know this works is because this information is from Doug Tallamy, who's an insect scientist, so he knows what insects eat, so he knows what to plant so that insects have something to eat and therefore birds have something to eat, especially when they're breeding. So, uh, Dr. Tallamy started with 10 acres. This is his personal residence. The 10 acres that is his personal residence used to be a hay field, but when he moved in, he started planting that 10 acres with these high-ranking plants. And as a result, it took five years to get up to 30 species of breeding birds, and it took 10 years to get up to 60 species of breeding birds. That doesn't happen by accident. Breeding birds are on your property because you have what they need to eat when they're breeding and feeding their young. So I want you to take advantage of this information so you can be part of the solution for restoring native plants, restoring habitats based on native plants, providing habitat for our bees and butterflies because they are our pollinators and we need pollinators in order to have plants that provide oxygen and in order to have plants that provide food. So to do that, you can go to nwf.org slash native plant finder. Now another thing I wanted to show you on the native plant finder is that when I click on oak then it gives me up to 15 species of caterpillars that are supported by that uh, genus of plants. So for example I can see here that oak supports the bantam maple dagger moth and the spun glass oak slug and the white furcula and the climbing moth and the rosy maple moth and the choke cherry and the elm sphinx and the great leopard moth and the interrupted dagger moth and the definite tussock moth and the variable oak leaf caterpillar and the banded purple and the pale beauty and the purple crested slug and the royal walnut moth all of these are caterpillars that are supported by oaks. So that's kind of a fun little study of some of the, you know, the, the animals that are supported by when you have the right plants. And all of this is bird food. And if it, if it doesn't get eaten as a, in the caterpillar stage, if it becomes an adult moth or butterfly, then it becomes a pollinator. And pollinators help crop production and pollinators help plants be more plentiful. When plants have more seeds and, and, and fruits, then they feed wildlife and so on up the food chain, but it starts with a good, healthy collection of native plants. We're almost out of time, but I wanted to invite you to message me on Facebook. I'm Hart Hagen, H-A-R-T-H-A-G-A-N. You can also find me, uh, I want to invite you to join the Wild Ones Louisville group. Wild Ones Louisville is an organization dedicated to this native plant material and how they support ecosystems. I want you to uh, find Wild Ones Louisville group on Facebook. And I want to give you two recommendations for books to follow up on this material. One is by Doug Tallamy, T-A-L-L-A-M-Y. It's called Bringing Nature Home. And the other is by Heather Holm, H-O-L-M, Heather Holm. The name of the book is Pollinators of Native Plants. Those two books together will provide an excellent library 
for uh, native plants and how they support insects and ecosystems. Thanks very much. Join me next time.